This is a Hog Sports Network podcast. You're listening to the Whole Hog Football Podcast, bringing you the latest news, analysis, and more. Here's your host, Matt Jones, with Scotty Bordelon of the Hog Sports Network and wholehogsports.com. Arkansas is just kind of an average football team. I, I think that's the conclusion that you can come to through six weeks of the season. The Razorbacks 2-4 and four overall, 0-3 oh in conference play. They're competitive. They're they're good enough to be competitive with good teams. They easily could have come out of Baton Rouge and Oxford with road wins. They easily could have beaten BYU. Uh, you know, you take away a couple of non-offensive touchdowns, and you wonder how the Texas A&M game might have gone a couple of weeks ago in Arlington. But the bottom line is they're not winning those games. Uh, they're not good enough to close out these games against teams that have more talent than them. And, and certainly, you know, that's that's what you're ultimately graded on. Uh, today on the Whole Hog Football Podcast, we're going to talk about Arkansas Ole Miss, obviously, the Razorbacks losing that game 27 to 20. And then a little bit later, we're going to give what we would consider our mid mid midway grades, uh, midterm grades. That's the word I was going for, midterm grades. I'm Matt Jones. I'm with Scotty Bordelon and Ethan Westerman. And let's start with the Ole Miss game. The Razorbacks go to Oxford. They didn't play very well. Uh, offensively, it was another, you know, it's kind of a, I think I'd probably call this offense constipated right now. Uh, they need a good uh, dose of Dokalax somewhere down the line. Uh, it wasn't that case at Ole Miss. A little bit better than it was against Texas A&M, uh, but still just real hard to watch this team offensively. They go down the field 80 yards on their first drive, and then it was a lot of, you know, real difficult sledding against a, an Ole Miss defense that's not very good this year. Uh, Ole Miss – held Arkansas in check from a run game perspective. We're going to talk more about the run game here in just a second, but it has not been good the last two games, two of the worst games running the football that I can ever remember by Arkansas. Scotty, your thoughts on the Ole Miss game, Arkansas being competitive enough to have a chance to win at the end. They had the lead in the fourth quarter, but once again, not being able to, to pull out a close game. Yeah, I think what we saw last week from Ole Miss was – kind of what we talked about on the podcast preview in the game. It's like, are they going to be able to bring enough energy uh, the weekend after, you know, you have such an emotional high. It's really hard to come back and and be energized uh, a second week in a row. And I think it was a good thing for Ole Miss that it was Arkansas that they get, that they had to play um, in an offense that doesn't really have an identity, doesn't know what it's really good at. They know what they're bad at, uh, but they're not really sure – at this point, it's the midway through the season with what they can hang their hat on because the run game's not there. Passing game's pretty spotty. I think you've got like one consistent playmaker on the perimeter now that Luke has is gone. Um, and the offensive line is just, it's littered with with question marks and, and frustration, I think. Um, I think, it, and it's, it's kind of the opposite of the Ole Miss game to me. It's like the defense you know, deserved to get out of there with a win the other night, but the offense couldn't, you know, hold up its end of the bargain. It was just, it was, it was so frustrating to watch just like you mentioned that opening drive, you know, they had to, I think, convert a fourth down and then they had, you know, some third down conversions and looked pretty good. Like it took a lot, it really took a lot to get that opening touchdown, but they did it and maybe, you were thinking it was going to give them some confidence to be able to move the ball the rest of the game. And it was just a, yeah, it was just a slog. Um, just not a fun offense to watch. Mm-hmm. And now I think in the last four weeks, KJ's got six picks and he threw nine, all of 2021 and 2022. So now your vet quarterback who's, you know, probably a little bit mentally and physically worn down. He's, you know, not taking – as good a care of the football as you would like uh it's probably just a bunch of compounding things it's like he's he's got more on him now than i think he's had in previous years because the run game's not going and i think his playmakers are a little bit limited or they're not playing to some of them aren't playing to to what they're capable of so it's just it's a it's a lot of things i thought the defense played pretty good especially given all the guys that got banged up in the game like it's linebacker it's d line um, at one point in the game, you're down on both of your starting cornerbacks and then you're starting safety and you're having to play TJ Metcalf, who some, some fans who don't pay a whole lot of attention 
maybe to what we write during the week, they're probably wondering who that who that is. Hmm. Uh, when he's being counted on on Ole Miss's final scoring drive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the defense deserved to win that game. Uh, I thought they I thought they had a good game plan against an Ole Miss offense that looked a little bit tired. I, th- I think or a little bit heavy leg. Um, I think the game plan was good on defense, deserving of a win. Um, I think anytime you can hold an offense like Ole Miss to 27, um, you've got to think the other side of the ball for your team can can score that many just based on um, Ole Miss defenses of, of the past. But, um, yeah, just not enough firepower, I don't think. And, um, yeah, just a, it's a, another tough game to, to bounce back from. And now your reward is you get to you get to go to Tuscaloosa. It's pretty tough. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Arkansas held Ole Miss to 349 yards. Ole Miss was coming off a game where they had over 700 against LSU. And so I think that, you know, we talked about this last week, they're primed for a little bit of a letdown. And I think we saw that. But there were still moments where it wasn't like Ole Miss was playing poorly offensively. I thought there were moments where Arkansas's defense stepped up and made great plays. Even the, you know, you talked about the interception by K.J. Jefferson, the first one puts Ole Miss at the Arkansas three. It took them four attempts from the three-yard line to get in and and punch in that touchdown. They have to kind of roll the dice a little bit and go for it on fourth and one. And Quinshawn Judkins gets in on on fourth and goal. You know, I I just thought there were a lot of moments like that uh, late in the game. The defense forced, I think, Ole Miss into a field goal attempt after they got inside the the 10 or the five-yard line. And so, you know, they were put in a lot of bad situations, but they made – the best of it of those bad situations and and gave the offense a chance to win you look at this this is three games now this year BYU Texas A&M and Ole Miss where Arkansas's defense did enough I think to win the game Uh, you might look at Texas A&M say they scored 34 well they also had a punt return for a touchdown they had to pick six for a touchdown totally you know changes that game BYU they scored 38 but you look at where they started from you know, they were, they were starting on Arkansas side of the field or, or right near midfield, almost every one of their scoring drives. And they, and they capitalized every time that they got a short yardage situation. Um, the offense was supposed to be the strength of this team and that's not happening. Quarterback play was supposed to be the strength of this team. And that's not happening. You mentioned the six interceptions. There've been a ton of other interceptable passes that KJ Jefferson has thrown, um, you know, including two or three against Ole Miss that probably could have been picked off. He gets intercepted twice in that game. I just look at this. Um, you know, this does not look like the offense that I thought we were going to see uh, from, from Danny. You know, it's when you go back and you look at the 2022 highlights for Maryland and Talia Tonga-Valoa, um, it looked like a totally different offense than what we're seeing at Arkansas. I don't know if it's a, a matter of personnel I don't know if what it is, why we're seeing it so different. But I, I will say that when you look at Maryland right now, they took Ohio State to the wire the other day in Columbus, or at least took them into the fourth quarter of a competitive game. I think Maryland's got the number one offense in the Big Ten. I think what we saw what we're beginning to see is that the results at Maryland last year were maybe more of a byproduct of Mike Loxley or some combination of Mike Loxley and Dan Enos working in tandem than it was a Dan Enos offense because what we've seen at Arkansas certainly is nothing like what we saw on video from Maryland last year, which looked a lot like Arkansas's offense under Kendall Bryles. Yeah, to me, there's just not much – there's not much ex- explosion in this offense at all. Um, and I think Arkansas's like if you look at – Remember what, what were we told in the preseason? Like Isaiah Satanius coming on, it's looking good. Like I mean, Matt, you you saw it. We all saw it in the preseason. Satania, I thought was one of their top three guys. Mm-hmm. And every time we saw him at practice, he's making catches, getting up field quick. Look, um, what we did in the spring game. Yeah, had a great spring game. Um, and he can't find his way on the field now, and they can't get the ball in his hands. And we were told Jaden Wilson. You know, kind of like Jaden Johnson, kind of had a a mindset change. You know, after last season and going into the summer months and fall camp, like he might be a guy that could contribute. He's like kind of disappeared, mm-hmm. and Bryce Stevens has completely disappeared. Like he's not even. I don't even know if he's pl- he's not playing or getting offensive snaps anymore. I'm sure if he's on the bus. So, 
yeah yeah not even sure he's on the travel roster to be honest um i just don't know that they know how to get all of these guys involved in the offense and isaac tesla is another one he got two catches for seven yards the last two weeks like he's you brought him in to you know, probably be your number two guy to Andrew Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And right now it seems like the number two guy to Andrew Armstrong is whoever Arkansas has healthy at tight end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's been a couple different guys um, to this point in the year. Like Andrew Armstrong's kind of the guy on offense that you can look to. And like, if I throw him the ball, we think something's good. Something good's going to happen. But that all, like, if you, if, if you're able to get him the ball, like, you you also you also have to count on protection up front to have, to give KJ time to get Andrew the ball. So it's 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 a bunch of different things. It's just it's I've been wholly disappointed in in the offense right now, and I just don't know it. And Rocket Rocket's been at his best in the screen game. Like they've got to try to get him. Mm -hmm. I think going more in the screen game because that's the last couple of weeks. That's that's all they've been able to do to, you know, get him to stretch his legs because it's not happening, you know, otherwise. And, um, you know, Dubinion's coming in for a play or two, and then he'll go out, and then A.J. Green comes in, and, you know, maybe he doesn't do much. And it's just like they're try. it seems like they're trying to get guys going, and it's just like it's just not working. And I think Tyrus Washington was – is he might be a good development for them. I've, I've long thought that he's got – a really good body and he's phys he's he's got really good size and i think he's got speed to go with that um i want to see more of him because i think he can be like that lucas type guy that can maybe um maybe get the, get this offense energized again but you know again at the same time it all comes back to, to the offensive line giving kj enough time to uh, to to look for those guys to get the ball moving down the field one thought real quick on Tyrus Washington. He goes for, I mean, he goes for 90 yards and two touchdowns in what is essentially his first playing time of the year. I know he's gotten on the field a little bit, but but not very much. It's just amazing to me that they have had that in the wings for the last five weeks and we never saw it until Luke has gets hurt. And maybe that's something to be said about Tyrus Washington. And maybe he's just a gamer and he knows that it's his time to step up. But the fact that, you know, it, it just kind of goes back to what you were talking about, all these other players that, you know, that some of them got playmaking potential, but they're not getting on the field. Um, I don't know. It's just bizarre to me, Ethan. You know, it's kind of funny because I think after the first game of the season, um, Western Carolina, we thought that was kind of the offense we might see the rest of the year. Granted, it was against much lower competition and there were still question marks about like there wasn't really a run game in that game. Why wasn't Satania involved? And since that game, it's like not only is there still not a run game, not only is Satania not involved, but you aren't even seeing remotely the type of like playmaking ability that we saw um, in that first game. And granted, a lot of that has to deal with the offensive line and KJ not having as much time as maybe he had in that game. Um, and it, it it just seems to me like we're kind of as the season progressing, seeing just issues that maybe you spotted early in the season, you know, in the, that Western Carolina game or mm -hmm. the Kent state game, you're just seeing those continually get exposed. Um, just there were questions about the offensive line immediately after the first game. And it just kind of, I felt got a little bit shrugged off almost Um, in time is told, like definitely those were issues. Um, They have been all along. And yeah, like Scotty said, it's just like you have these guys that Isaiah Satania is one of the best playmakers you have. Um, I mean, you've seen it on in the return game. We saw it in the spring. We saw it in practices. It's just like, how is this guy not getting involved more? I remember um, Traylon Burks, there were some games that he wasn't really getting involved in the pass game. And it's like they would find some way to get him the ball and get him going a little bit, whether that was on some run play, even designed for him sweeping across. They would just or a short little passes just to get his hands on it. It was like they were finding ways to get their best playmaker the ball. And I get it. People probably, it's hard to, for people who haven't seen Satania, maybe the way that we have in practice and stuff to, to be like, how do you know he's the best, like one of the best playmakers? <laughs> it's just, I mean, you aren't seeing it on Saturdays, but we've all seen that he's super fast. He's 
just got intangibles that not a lot of other people have. And it's just, it's just crazy to me that we're staring at midway through the season heading to Alabama. And it's like that he still hasn't been involved in the offensive game plan much. Um, It's wild to see the run game struggle the way it has. I mean, we've all hit on that already. It's just, you're seeing, um, you're just seeing Arkansas still not have things figured out midway through the year. It's almost like there's, you're, you kind of would want your team at this point to be figuring out things more. It's like each week you're getting a, maybe a little bit more concerned. I know that this was probably the Ole Miss game. It wasn't probably, it was a step forward from the A&M game, but that's not really saying much. Um, but in a way it's almost, in my opinion, maybe a little bit more disheartening about the offense that it's, you, you put up 20 points against an Ole Miss defense that just got done letting LSU do whatever they wanted against them. Um, yep. you, I, I, we all kind of felt like this was the game that Arkansas's offense could maybe have a, you know, a sneaky good performance, but that clearly wasn't the case. Well, and even Texas A&M as good as they were along the defensive front, look what Jalen Milrow did to them this last week, and it's a career game for him, and, and he hadn't been playing very well. Um, so, you know, again, I think there there may be something to that, that Alabama's figuring things out on offense, but it just seems like we're seeing these defenses have the best game of their year against Arkansas, and, you know, over time, that's not a coincidence. It's a it's a concern. And I, you know, two, two, two other thoughts here real quick. Defensively, I think that we're seeing improvement out of Arkansas for them to play as well as they did against Ole Miss. Ole Miss had a quarterback injury. I know that. I think they might've had a running back injury. Um, whatever. It, it's still a really talented Ole Miss offense. And you had a lot of Arkansas defensive players that were out with injuries and it didn't seem like who went out. Somebody came right back in and now they're making plays uh, Nico Davalier is, is a, a, an example on the defensive front. You haven't seen him just a whole lot this year. And, and there he goes in and, and he made some really nice plays in that game down in Oxford. And that group is, it feels like they are getting better game by game. Um, offense, you can't say that. And I know that they've lost some playmakers. Luke has, um, I th- again, I go back to Tyrus Washington and coming in and having a big game against Ole Miss. And it makes you wonder, could some of these other guys who aren't seeing the field, could they have that type of breakout performance if they do get to see the field? And, you know, with a, a player like Satania, and we use Satania as an example just because, uh, you know, he's, he's a local guy. We know who he is. We've seen him in, in high school. We've seen him have the big spring game. We know the type of speed that he has. But, but, but with a guy like Satania, if blocking is an issue, then put him in, an, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, put him in the game where blocking is not going to be something that's going to limit him. Um, if receiving catching the ball is an issue, put him in the game where maybe you're handing it off to him, run him on a jet sweep or something. Just get the ball in their hands and see what they can do with it. Um, I think you might be surprised with some of these players. And he's not the only one uh, that we're, we're talking about. Scotty mentioned a number of them just a second ago. Uh, but one more thought on offense. I thought the ultimate throw your hands up moment Saturday night was when they reverted back offensive line wise. They practice all week with a certain offensive line with Kudis at center, Lemmer at guard, Latham at tackle. Um, doesn't go well, obviously, in the first half. And then all of a sudden, it's a wholesale change at halftime. We're going to go back to the offensive line that we've had the previous, you know, three, four games, whatever it was, going into it. And that offensive line set worked best. I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. They moved the ball better in the second half than they did in the first half. But if you're not if you're not identifying that during the week leading up to the game, then what are you doing? I mean, it just, it it seemed like a very uh, odd move to say, we're going to go into it with this idea on the offensive line. And then 20 minutes, 25 minutes into the game, completely scrap that and, and go a different direction. At least it was, it it struck me as odd, Scotty. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. And I, I know Arkansas's offensive numbers, they were better. Uh, in the second half than than in the first half, like in terms of yards. And obviously they scored more points in the second half, but it wasn't like they just lit the world on fire yardage wise in the second half. You know what I mean? I'm trying to pull up the box score right here. Um, well, they had 286 yards. Half. I think they had about 120 so they at had time. At 120, 122 yards in the first half, 166 okay. in the second half. Um, your yards per play. Oh uh, gosh, I can't even. Fight. So they had three and a half yards in the first half, five in the second half. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, the same number of pass attempts. Your rush attempts went went down. Obviously, I say you're you're just trying to move the ball down the field and score. But um, 
yeah, I just didn't I like, I don't know. It just, I don't know if panic is the right word to say. Um, but I didn't think it was going terribly. I don't know. Maybe I could be, maybe I, I'm on, on obviously not a, a great football mind, but I didn't think it was to the point where you just got to completely scrap it. Um, you know, I think you can you can try some more quick hitting stuff that takes kind of the offensive line out of the equation for the most part. Um, if Andrew Armstrong's got like a seven or eight yard cushion on the perimeter, take that snap and sling it out to the side and let your your best playmaker um, make a play. Get, I mean, you can get the offensive line on the move with the screen game, like I mentioned earlier with Rocket. Like there are, are ways to. Um, I think there are things you you could have done with that with that first offensive line group, but it was interesting on Monday to hear Sam say that you know at this point like with veterans like like Bo, I just don't like you got to keep him at center, and I'm like I don't know I don't honestly I don't necessarily I don't necessarily agree with it, but I mean I'm not a, a former offensive line coach and a head coach, but mm-hmm. I just think you've got to. Maybe that is what's best for right now, but I didn't think that maybe the offensive line in the first half was as as maybe I'm totally wrong on that. I just didn't think it was a I didn't think it was absolutely necessary. Like you can just you can keep trying it and um and hoping it gets better. Like because that's what you did with the group that's what you did with the group that you went to in the first, you know, few weeks of the year. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You just kind of stuck with it and hoped that it would improve. Um yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a Maybe it's I just don't understand it, but um, yeah, we'll see. I don't imagine that um, there will be many more offensive line changes this year, other than you know maybe if Devin Manuel gets healthy, um, maybe um, maybe Andrew Chambly sits. But I, I would I would imagine that might be the the only move that that might happen. Yeah, I think I think Patrick Kuda struggled some with the center position early in the game, and I think that was probably what led them to making the wholesale change at halftime. Because I, I believe they brought Slimmer back over to center even before halftime. And then after halftime, they said, let's just go back to the to the five that we know works well together when or works best together based on what they had uh, when, when Limmer is at center. It's ugly average football. That's, that's what it comes down to. What Arkansas is playing right now is just ugly average football. And I think average is a really bad place to be because if you're bad, people know you're bad. And there's no real expectations that are there when you're average and you have the capability to play with some of these teams, like we've seen in LSU, in Ole Miss with BYU, even to a certain extent with Texas A&M, it's just really frustrating to kind of watch the the carpet get pulled out from underneath you at the end of the game time and time and time again. And that's what we've seen so much this year with the Razorbacks. The whole hog football podcast is sponsored by Kendall King design display signage, kindleking.com. It's K-E-N-D-A-L-K-I-N-G.com. The Kindle King Group family of companies plays to win, just like our hogs. We know how demanding retail marketing is today. From digital omni-channel creative services, through in-store signing and displays, and finally to social influence, we've got you covered. Our KKG Inc. family of companies, Kindle King, Shopcart Creative, and Soapbox Influence are winning with multiple retailers and brands. We play to win and we'll be a winning partner for all your retail marketing service needs. Go Hogs! All right, we're going to give our midterm grades right now. I think you can probably tell by the first 20 or so minutes of this podcast kind of how we feel about the Razorbacks. Uh, but we'll start on offense. It's it's really the story of the year right now. You thought the offense would be a, a strength for the Razorbacks. It has not been. And so we'll kind of give you our assessment of it. I think through six games, I would give the offense a D as in dog, uh, as in dog ugly at times. Positives, I would say tight end play. Luke has has been or or was very good before uh, he got hurt. Again, Tyrus Washington comes in and, and plays really well against Ole Miss the other night. You know, we knew tight ends were going to be a focal point of a Danny Enos offense. We saw it when he was here from 2015 to 17. Hunter Henry, Jeremy Sprinkle, uh, A.J. Derby, the the tight end play during those years. Well, I think Derby might have actually been before him, but the tight end play during those years uh, was really good for Arkansas. And so that was the expectation. They would have good tight end play. They would get them uh, into the offensive uh, plan, especially from a passing standpoint. And, and that's been the case this year. As Scotty said, 
Arkansas's best receiver or second best receiver all year has been its tight end in just about every game. I think that's really the only positive you can point to on offense. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you could say Andrew Armstrong, but you know, I've got written down here, the negatives, I would say, obviously the offensive line, uh, nowhere near the level that you thought it would be in the fourth year under Sam Pittman. I think the quarterback play has been very disappointing. That's probably a little bit due uh, to the offensive line that's in front of him. But I just thought we'd see KJ Jefferson make on a lot more plays this year than what we've seen to this point. Uh, the run game's been disappointing. The receivers outside of Andrew Armstrong has been disappointing. And the red zone offense has been disappointing. You can look at red zone stats, and, and you'll see that Arkansas has got one of the best red zone percentages in the country. There's a lot of field goals in there. I think they've been to the red zone 21 times, and they've got 14 touchdowns out of it. I think they've got six field goals. And that, that's that been very disappointing, I think, the red zone. So I, I'm going to go D for the offense, Scotty. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I've got a D too. Just some of the notes I wrote down. Just, I mean, it's not really anything earth shattering. I don't think the run game's just been non-existent. Like Arkansas's got its two lowest rushing totals of the Pittman era in the last two weeks. Um, not good. Like they can't. Like KJ can't even really get loose on those designed quarterback runs. Um, and maybe they were trying to force it the other night on like that third and goal from the nine and they ran a it looked like a designed run with him. Maybe they're just trying to get him going in some ways. Um, but I think that right there is opening up him up to more body shots. Like he's like, I'm already taking him on passing downs. I don't really want to take too many of these when I'm running the football. Um, protection's been bad. Passing game feels like it's it like it comes in spurts, you know what I mean? Like Saw it a little bit against LSU. They got Broden involved a little bit. Um, obviously, Luke has. Um, Andrew Armstrong's been like the only guy that I would say is having a really good year. Um, he's got 20 more catches than any other active pass catcher. Like Isaac Tesla is second with 15. Um, and that's a guy, like I said earlier, he's got two catches for less than a first down in the last two weeks. Um, he seems like the only guy that can go get you something right now. Um, but him getting something depends on, you know, six other people. Um, so it's it's not exactly the um the best best formula for success there. But yeah, it's Jaden Wilson's got eight catches or 136 yards and a touchdown, and half of those yards came on one play um on the first series of the season. He's not he's not really giving them much. Um who else here? Davion Dozier got one catch in the season opener. Barquise Gums, one catch for two yards. It's like they've got these playmakers or these guys that were, you know, we were told were, um, you know, capable playmakers, and they're just not, they're just not making them. And, and I think that's just kind of the, kind of the offense to this point in a nutshell. Maybe I'm too harsh of a critic, um, but I'm giving them an F for the year. F as in freaking hard to watch. Um, it's really difficult to watch this offense. It's frustrating. Um, I just think if you're dead last in the SEC in yards per game, it, I mean, you've got Vandy ahead of you. You've got Auburn, which, I mean, these teams that I look at and I say, oh, they got terrible offenses, and you look at the numbers, Arkansas is worse than them in yards per game. They're really bad in the red zone at punching it in. Um, and it's it's really sad to give them an F, in my opinion, because you have so many guys like K.J. Jefferson. I still think he's a great quarterback who's got a terrible offensive line and is causing him to – you know, just play mental games in the middle of, you know, in the past, it just seemed like KG was just out there playing loose and that's when he's at his best. Um, you got some playmakers that you're really happy with, like, you know, Andrew Armstrong and whenever Luke has is in there. So there's just, it's just, it's frustrating because there's good pieces there, but all in all, um, it's like, if you can't, if they aren't figuring it out, how to just move the ball down the field, um, then, then the defense is, on the field so often because it's like not only are these games where they're not moving the ball down the field like it's not just that it's also that they're usually three and outs I feel like it's just like especially that Texas A&M game I'm thinking too that was just so hard to watch um but yeah and then they get in these games that maybe the offense is having some success it's like they get penalized <laughs> all the time um just it's 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 a hard offense to watch I think the numbers back it up that they're that an F I think is kind of worthy. They're at the bottom half of near the very, very bottom of every single like good offensive category in the SEC. So I'm giving them an F. Maybe that makes me a hater. Well, and, and they're not playing great defenses. I think there is something to be said for what you're saying. They're not playing great defenses. Texas A&M, they struggle. That's fine. A&M's got a top 10 defense nationally. Everybody else they played, 
at least among FBS, BYU is 62, Ole Miss is 87. Uh, you scroll on down here, you've got uh, Kent State at 108, and LSU is 124. So those are yeah, the defenses I, they played. I have a theory that LSU's defense will make whatever offense it's playing look pretty good. And Probably if you so. set aside the stats from LSU's game and then the opener against Western Carolina, like these these season stats for Arkansas's offense are really ugly. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard to watch. Mentioned real quick, uh, the, the running game, just terrible. The last two games, 68 carries for 78 yards in the last two games. And Ole Miss had the number 12 defense in the SEC run defense coming into that game. They're averaging 1.1 yard per carry their last two games. Some of that is because of sacks. You take away the 12 sacks and readjust it for sacks. They're averaging 2.7 yards per carry. Not as bad as 1.1, but but still, that's not going to get it done whenever your identity is built around the run game as an offense. So it's it's just been really bad offensively for Arkansas. Uh, defense, real quick, I'd give Arkansas a minus. I've got written down here positives. Uh, they've been able to force a lot of turnovers. Um, I, I kind of – I don't know how I feel about this. I think their tackling was okay against Ole Miss the other night. There have been some games where the tackling has been a problem. I've kind of got it kind of in an in-between. Uh, same with their run defense. You know, their middle-of-the-pack SEC run defense, 126 yards per game. Not a g- great number, but it's not a terrible number either. We've seen it a lot worse. Uh, negatives, I think that their third-down defense has been really bad this year. They just struggled so much getting teams off the field third down. And I and I say that realizing full well that Ole Miss struggled on third down for a good bit of the, the game the other night. But, you know, we're looking at this from a, 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 the entire season perspective and then their pass rush I think is a negative to me I I thought their pass rush was going to be a lot more dynamic than it has been I know they've had some sacks uh, but you know I think that a lot of those sacks and and pressure numbers are inflated a little bit by the teams that they played the first two or three weeks and and they haven't been as good in SEC play yeah I think I'm going to go with a little bit better grade I'm going to go with a C plus I think the D line has been fine Um, they, they are they are you know I think run defense has been okay um, you know, you come out of that Texas A&M game um, and you're thinking you, know, you gave up 200 through the air through 200 on the ground. It's not looking real great. Uh, I know some of the the biggest plays that Ole Miss had the other day were um, were on the ground. But I think you, I think I think the de- the defensive line has been has been fine. I think Jeff Coat maybe might st- be starting to step out a little bit. Um Jaheim Thomas, I think, has been good at linebacker. They need some other guys um, like Antonio Greer and Jordan Crook, uh, Brad Spence. I think they they need those guys to bring it weekly because I think we've seen that Jaheim Thomas and um, who have a little bit of difficulty playing like the bulk of the sets, like ninety plus percent. Um, so I think they need I think they need playable depth there every week, and I think the secondary has been better, obviously, than in years past. It'd be hard to be worse. Um, still not great, but okay. Like they're coming up with some takeaways. Um, and I think it was, I think last week was kind of a testament to, um, maybe some young guys that you've got in the room, like TJ Metcalf and, um, Jalen Braxton has, has stood out a couple of times this year. So I, I'll give the defense a C plus. I'm going to keep it going with giving them a little bit better grade. I, I would actually give them a B. I think that if, you know, you have to take into account that second half at LSU, and then even bleeding into the first half a little bit against a and it was really bad. I mean, obviously not a B in any of those situations, but putting those aside, I think the defense has given an offense a chance this year, and I feel like we haven't – What just what we've seen is a defense that's out there fighting and trying and an offense that never rewards them, like, whenever they get a stop. I don't want to say never. There's been a few instances, but I think this defense is actually playing pretty well. Um, I mean – I think they've scored three defensive touchdowns this year, maybe four. Um, so, I mean, they're even scoring you points. Um, and Lord knows that this team needs that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's – I would give them a little bit better grade. I think that kind of, you know, with the amount of time that they're having to spend on the field because of the offense, it kind of maybe um, doesn't give them as fair of a, you know, as fair of a shot to get graded as maybe uh, they deserve. I think that most of the time they're keeping you in the game. And I'm really – I really think that what they did at Ole Miss was impressive. So I'll give them a B. Real quick before we get out of here, special teams. I've got written down a B minus positives. Cam Little, nine of ten on field goals. He's booming them from fifty plus. I thought that they should have kicked him in, in one of the instances where they punted the other night. Satania has been kind of up and down, but he had the big touchdown against BYU in the punt return game. He's had a couple of 
nice kickoff returns. I, I think that that's a, a positive, you know, and then some things that you take for granted, their protection has been good on their punts. Their snapping has been good on all their kicks. Those are things that you don't notice until they go bad. And, and those have been consistent for them. Negative this year, punt coverage has not been good. And Anaya Smith had the big touchdown return then had another big return against him in the A&M game. And then their punting has just been very inconsistent. Fletcher's boomed some, he's had some shanks and you add that with the punt coverage and they're just averaging 31 yards net punting right now. And so that's certainly uh, uh, not good for them from a special teams perspective. Yeah. I'm going to go with a C two for Cam Little. He is doing a lot of, a lot of work uh, holding that grade up. I think Max Fletcher has been, I think he's been okay this year. I want to say he's been largely been okay other than like the, the shank against BYU and then out kicking his coverage against A&M, but all that plays into it, you know? So um, yeah, I'm going to go with the C and um, thank Cam Little for that. He's He's been really consistent since his first miss this year. You know, I think I'll give him a B on the year right now. Cam Little's having an all SEC, all SEC type of year. I mean, there's some really good kickers in the league, so who knows if he'll actually get it. I mean, you think of Will Reichert at Alabama and then the Missouri kicker, uh, Mevis. So he, I think he's having an all SEC type of year. I don't know if he'll get it. He's kind of holding that grade together. Max Fletcher, aside from his shanks, I mean, he's punting really well, but you got to take the shanks into account. So um, with all the points that you gave, Matt, I kind of agree. Just all those uh, – all those – little things you have to take into account, like, you know, the Anaya Smith punt return touchdown. Those just lower the grade from what aside has been, you know, a really good um, year from, I think, your kicker and a pretty good year from your punter once you minus the shanks. So, Well, there you have it. Those are our grades for Arkansas midway through the season. They play Alabama on Saturday. It may not look too good that day either. Alabama is certainly getting things turned around. Come to wholehogsports.com throughout the week for our coverage leading up to that game. And we'll be back with another podcast Thursday to look closer at the matchup. For Scotty Bordelon and Ethan Westerman, I'm Matt Jones. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Whole Hog Football Podcast. The proceeding has been a production of the Hog Sports Network. Look for our daily podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. For more Razorbacks coverage, go to wholehogsports.com or follow the Hog Sports Network reporters on social media.